The world has over 6,000 different languages. However, if we want to train a model to translate from one language to another, for example, for a machine translation system, we typically need paired data, meaning we need examples of sentences in one language and the corresponding translation to another, such as this example, I think therefore I am in English, corresponding to French, je pense donc je suis. So the way that we would train a machine translation system is we would typically take a large corpus of paired examples, meaning sentences in one language with their corresponding translation to another, and then train a translation model on this. And once that model is trained, it can take in sentences in the source language and produce their corresponding translations in the target language. But this approach can be pretty onerous if you consider how many languages there are especially when it comes to obscure languages or languages that just don't have as many speakers. These are sometimes referred to as low-resource languages. For instance, how many paired sentences do you think there are in existing data sets for translating Maltese into Tibetan? When uh, researchers at Google had to contend with this problem for Google Translate, they thought about more creative solutions. And I want to tell you about one of these because I think it illustrates an important principle about deep learning. So a standard machine translation system uh, would train separate models for every pair of languages. So if you want to translate English into French, you would get a corpus of English sentences and their corresponding French translations. Uh, you might also get a corpus of English sentences and their corresponding Spanish translations, maybe another one of French sentences and their corresponding tra Spanish translations, and so forth. Uh, what... Uh, these folks wanted to do to alleviate this issue with low resource languages is to instead build a multilingual machine translation model. Instead of having separate models for every pair of languages, they would have a single model that can read in a sentence in any language and then translate it into any other desired language when provided with an additional input that specifies the target language. So you would take this multilingual model, give it your, your sentence in whatever language it happens to be in, and then you would tell it, turn this into Spanish, and it would output the corresponding sentence in Spanish. Now, crucially, a model like this can be trained on exactly the same data as the uh, collection of standard models listed above. You simply take all of your paired English and French sentences and uh, label those as uh, having the target language French, you take all of your French to Spanish sentences, label those as having the target language Spanish, and so on and so on. Conceivably, you could also tell the model what the source language is, but the model can usually figure that out just from looking at the source sentence. So training such a model doesn't require any other data. You're just taking the data you already have and using it in a different way. Now, why might this be a good idea? Well, um, those of you that speak uh, multiple languages might uh, already be guessing as to what's going on here. Uh, a lot of languages share commonality. So uh, if you know how to speak Spanish, for instance, that doesn't mean that you can speak Italian. Of course, Italian and Spanish are different languages. But it does mean that you can often make a decent educated guess as to the meaning of, indiv of individual Italian words because there might be similar words in Spanish based on similar roots. Right? So a multilingual model of this sort conceivably could learn commonalities between languages and even for languages for which it has relatively few examples, it could figure out uh, kind of uh, educated guesses as to how to translate into those languages. Another thing such a model could do is it could uh, perform translation without requiring a particular pairing. So if you've translated English into Spanish and English into French and English into Japanese, your model probably has built up some sort of internal representation of English sentences so that if you then uh, also train on, for example, translating Japanese into Chinese, but you've never translated English into Chinese, your model may be able to figure out that the English sentence when it's read in is turned into some uh, universal representation that can then be decoded into uh, any language you want. So what did these researchers find? Well. One of the things they found, of course, is that such an approach could improve efficiency, uh, especially when it comes to translating into and out of low resource languages. Such an approach could work better than if the uh, model uh, was uh, than if you used a, a standard uh, single language model, uh, 
and the inclusion of more common languages made the low resource language translation work better. So if you have a low resource uh, uh, romance language that uses similar root words as Spanish and French, including lots of Spanish and French data, would also improve the quality of your translation into and out of that low resource language. Um, so that kind of makes sense. Another thing they found, which was a little more surprising, is that you could actually accomplish zero-shot machine translation, meaning you have a pair of languages for which you've never seen paired data. Now, that doesn't mean that you've never seen that language. So perhaps you trained on English to French, and French to English, and English to Spanish, and now you could translate French to Spanish. So you've seen French before, and you've seen Spanish before, but you've never seen uh, examples of going from one to the other. And this kind of zero-shot translation is exactly what I was talking about before, that essentially, if internally uh, the model has some internal representation that is agnostic to language, it makes sense that it would need to see all of the pairs of languages. Another interesting experiment um, that these researchers did is they studied what would happen if they told the model to decode to translate into a mix of languages. Now, the technical aspect of how this works, we'll find out a little bit more about that uh, when we talk more about supervised learning a few weeks from now. Uh, but at a high level, it's actually fairly easy when you have a model that is conditioned on a categorical variable, like a desired language, to also test it conditioning on a mix of those variables. Uh, because typically, when these variables are passed into the model, uh, they are represented as a collection of bits uh, and those bits can take on uh, values, typically those values are 0 and 1, but you can set them to fractional values also without any change to the model. Um, so that means it's very easy to take this model and to ask it, instead of producing English or French or Spanish, ask it to produce 40% Spanish and 60% French and see what it does with that. So it's kind of a weird experiment, but it gives us a little bit of insight uh, into the mind uh, of this model. It gives us a little bit of insight as to how it's actually processing these uh, multilingual uh, problems. So here's an experiment where uh, we are taking in an English sentence and then asking the model to output a mix of Spanish and Portuguese. So the uh, number here on the left side is the weight on Portuguese. So if it's 1.0, that means that you're asking the model to produce pure Portuguese. If it's 0.0, .0 that means you're asking it to produce pure Spanish. And anything in the middle is a mix. Uh, now, I don't speak uh, Spanish or Portuguese, uh, but just looking at these sentences, you can kind of get a sense for what's going on. The words get swapped out one at a time, so or, or two or three at a time. So gradually, uh, it replaces some of the Spanish words with Portuguese words until it turns the sentence into complete uh, Portuguese. So you can take a moment to look at the sentence. Here the other guinea pig cheer and was suppressed. Okay, that's the English sentence. And uh, on the first line, uh, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's Spanish, the Spanish, the, the word presumably uh, uh, for uh, uh, guinea pig is conejillo de india sanimo. Uh, I guess I don't speak Spanish, but I assume that's what it is. Uh, whereas if you look at the Portuguese translation at the bottom, you can see that it's a very different uh, word uh, that presumably means uh, guinea pig in, in Portuguese. Here's another interesting example. This is translating English into a mix of uh, Japanese and Korean. So the number here represents the percentage Korean. So if you're asking for WKO 1.0, that means you're asking for pure Korean. If you ask for 0.0, .0 that means it's pure Japanese. Now, Japanese and Korean use different scripts. Uh, so uh, interestingly enough, the actual output that's produced, um, it doesn't really spend a lot of time producing a mix of Japanese and Korean characters. So like, there's, there's like something weird going on at 0 0.58, but mostly it's either pure Japanese characters or pure Korean characters. However, uh, and I have to, again, take the author's word of this because uh, I don't read Japanese or Korean, but apparently the grammar in the uh, sentence that's produced actually more gradually switches from Japanese to Korean. So obviously at 0.0, .0 it's Japanese grammar. Apparently in the middle for 0.58 and 0.60, it switches over from Japanese characters to Korean characters, but the grammar looks more Japanese. And then for 0 0.70, 0 0.90, and 1.0, the grammar becomes more and more Korean. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, but this is my favorite example, and maybe it's my favorite because I actually um, can read the language, but um, 
Here, they're translating from English into either Russian or Belarusian. Uh, now, uh, and, and the number here represents the percentage of Belarusian. Now, the interesting thing here is that Belarusian is actually a very low resource language. Very, uh, relatively few people actually speak Belarusian, even in Belarus. Uh, so, uh, the translation into Belarusian is presumably going to be relying a lot more on other related languages, uh, such as Russian. Uh, so at 0, 0.0, it's a, it's a correct uh, translation to Russian. Um, I don't speak Belarusian, but the two languages are almost mutually intelligible. Uh, the sentence at the bottom looks pretty reasonable for a Belarusian sentence, I, I think. What's interesting is what happens in the middle. Uh, and you can kind of tell from looking at the words, even if you can't read the, the script, that uh, some of the words that pop up uh, for 0.44 and 0.46 don't look like either the words at the top in Russian or the words at the bottom in Belarusian. Um, Interestingly enough, the sentences that are produced in the middle for 0.44 and 0.46 are actually another language. That language, in this case, is Ukrainian. Um, and that actually makes a lot of sense because um, sort of the, the jump from Russian into Belarusian looks you know, a little similar to the jump from uh, Russian to Ukrainian. You know, both Belarusian and Ukrainian are um, you know, East Slavic languages, but with heavier influences from, uh, you know, Polish and, and, and other uh, Central European languages, as opposed to Russian, which is kind of further to the east. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense that a model that has fairly limited uh, data in Belarusian would utilize some of that additional knowledge that comes from also learning to translate into Ukrainian. Uh, and you just get this kind of Ukrainian sentence popping up in the middle of a translation uh, as you interpolate from Russian to Belarusian. So that's pretty cool. Now, uh, why did I want to tell you this anecdote to start off the class? Well, I think this, uh, this uh, story about this uh, multilingual model illustrates an important point about deep learning. I think this is a big part of why deep learning is so exciting. The story to me is really one of the representations. If we think of a very literal way to translate one language into another, we would say, well, let's just take a sentence in English and just like try to turn into a sentence in French. That's kind of a standard view of translation. But another way to think about the translation problem is to say, well, the sentence that you got, it was spoken in English, but it was the consequence of some thought that the speaker had. And this thought is in some sense language agnostic. So it's, it's like the semantic content of that phrase. And if you can figure out the thought, I don't mean like telepathy, I don't mean actually figure out what they were thinking, but sort of figure out some language of agnostic representation of the underlying meaning, and then imagine what it would look like for a French speaker to produce words corresponding to that same thought, then you could have a very powerful way of doing translation. Because then you wouldn't need to see pairs of all possible languages, right? The thought is language agnostic, so the thought transfers from one language to another trivially. So if you know how French speakers and Spanish speakers and English speakers and Belarusian speakers turn thoughts into words, and you know how to figure out thought from the word in each of those languages, then you don't need to see all the pairs. You just need to see for every language how that language can be turned into a thought and how that thought can be turned into a corresponding language. So you don't need all the pairs if you, if you can do this. This is another way of saying that machine translation becomes a lot easier if you have the right representation. So what I'm calling thought here very loosely is really a representation. It is, a, in this case, a representation of those uh, phrases that contains the semantic meaning um, without being uh, married to a particular language for expressing that meaning. Now, of course, this is a very lofty way of talking about it. In reality, of course, the model is not doing quite so some, something so fancy. It doesn't really understand what the words mean, but nonetheless, it comes up with some kind of representation that is more invariant to language uh, than the words themselves. So let's talk about representation learning. Uh, the classic view of machine learning problems is basically uh, a problem of predicting y from x. And when we learn kind of basic statistics, statistical fitting and so on, we see a picture that looks something like this. You have your x's, your inputs on the, on the horizontal axis, you have your y's, your outputs on the vertical axis, and your job is to figure out how to turn those x's into those y's by fitting some kind of model. In this case, uh, it's a linear fit, so we're, here we're fitting a, a linear model. Uh, but I think that this story about machine translation gives us a somewhat different view uh, of, of what machine learning could actually be doing. Um, so, 
what is x in practice? In practice, x is not just a number. It could be a sentence in another language. It could be an image. It could be a sound. It could be an utterance that someone spoke. All of these things are far more complex than a number. They contain far more structure inside them. And the big reason why uh, techniques like deep learning are so powerful and have generated so much excitement in recent years is that they can acquire representations of these complex inputs that are suitable for actually making uh, meaningful and complex predictions. Handling such complex inputs requires representations and deep learning methods allow us to automatically learn those representations. So the power of deep learning lies in the ability to learn such representations automatically from data. And that's going to be the topic of this class.